You're watching TVC Breakfast. On Friday, President Muhammad Buhari presented the 2023 appropriation bill of 20.5 trillion naira to the National Assembly. The president, while presenting the proposed budget, said that the subsidy regime must cease for the country's economy to blossom. He earmarked 3.6 trillion naira to fund fuel subsidy from January to June next year, with a warning that the subsidy regime must stop in order to save the country's economy from what he termed avoidable bleedings on a yearly basis. He noted that there will be alternative provisions to curb the effects of the petrol subsidy removal. That's the crux of our discussion next. Joining us via Zoom is a public sector analyst, Michael Oluagbemi. It's nice to have you join us this morning. Good morning. Right. Thanks for having me. Now, it, it, it seems that uh, when it comes to the removal of subsidy, it seems it's just, uh, it, it may not be as difficult as we may imagine it to be. Recall that uh, in 2012, uh, uh, former president, uh, Goodluck Jonathan, decided on the 1st of January, one day, to say, you know, subsidy has ended, and it, it led to whatever it led to. The idea of removal of subsidy, is it that easy to say, okay, from today going forward, we've removed it and then it is removed? Once again, good morning. Uh, very interesting question. The point I think always is not to miss out uh, the reality that uh, for a very long time, uh, as a country and as a people, we have been used to having our fuel, our energy costs subsidized. So whenever you are removing fuel subsidy, it is not just an economic decision. It's a social change uh, decision, a, a mentality uh, uh, attenuation or some kind of adjustment is required uh, from the overall populace. And of course, there's going to be winners and losers. So naturally speaking, there has to be what we call change management. And the government of the day has a duty. So when people use the 2012 analogy, um, they also do not also remember that uh, there was there was um, a, a, a whiff of ongoing corruption that was up to the 2011 election when subsidy rackets increased dramatically, when there were claims that fuel that were delivered to Nigeria were never delivered, and funds from that were then used to fund the 2011 election. So when the president then uh, tried to remove just immediately after his election in 2012. Uh, the fuel subsidy uh, around this claim, the people basically said, no, you, a beneficiary of a scam, a subsidy scam, after which there were a few convictions, by the way, likes of um, uh, um, uh, Ontario Hall and Gas and a few other companies were sanctioned, uh, where they are still, some of them are still even in court as we speak. So the, 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 the whiff of corruption and racketeering around 2011 to 2012 also made that decision in 2012 quite almost impossible, aside from the fact that the government did a very poor job of change management. When you're trying to remove something uh, population have been used to for over 40 years, you cannot just do it overnight. There has to be a period of consultation. There has to be periods of engagement. The National Assembly has to be carried along. In this case, as we are having this year, it is obvious to Nigerians that we cannot continue to sustain uh, a 4 trillion, 5 trillion naira almost 25% of our budget level of subsidy when we are actually 50% of that budget is being funded with deficit. So it does not make mathematical or arithmetic sense. Nigeria sustained this bill for the last three to four years at an almost impossible pace. The president and indeed the National Assembly have been properly sensitized. And even then they are still uh, giving some room to say, okay, we're going to keep this for another six months. We're going to give some senators are insisting that this has to be all held on for another one year. I think the right forum to debate for subsidy, as I also think the right forum to this debate most of the uh, economic, uh, socioeconomic issues in Nigeria should be the people's house. Um, these are not issues that are exclusively for the debate of the executive that has, of course, the national mandate to execute but does not have a national mandate to appropriate and to make public policy in terms of engaging the public to get their input and feedback. That responsibility belongs to the legislature. And I think that is the right for which the president has directed that particular issue this year. And it should have been from day one so that we can have public hearings, we can have people provide their inputs, we can weigh the uh, opinion of Nigerians, 
and the legislature as the people's house that has the responsibility for appropriation can then decide whether it wants to keep or it wants to remove the subsidy and how quickly it wants to do that, whether it wants to remove it very quickly and what sectors of the economy will then benefit from the additional funding that is not going into subsidy. I personally think that the subsidy should have been removed much earlier when the prices of uh, uh, gasoline as well as the prices of crude oil globally was quite much cheaper so that it gives Nigeria much more ability to absorb the shock. If you withdraw the subsidy at height, you still run a very big risk of riots and uh, uh, run, running inflation. So um, I believe that we could have done this easily in 2015, 2016, 2017, when the government was much newer, much more popular, and also you have a very, very low price of wealth. And of course, with that time, we are also facing some economic crisis. I always use the saying that uh, never waste a crisis, and we could have used that crisis to actually remove for subsidy, and Nigerians will have been much more used to it, and we'll have saved ourselves almost 10 to 15 trillion era, if you use the calculation, if not more, maybe 20 trillion era since 2017, and that money will have been better spent on our infrastructure, as well as our health and our education, and those things that are primary responsibilities of government, not subsidizing the fuel that goes into our SUVs and our vertical motor vehicles and trucks that are used and utilized mostly by the elite. Now, please distinguish, please distinguish our, our viewers. Subsidy and corruption. Because the sense is given that it is just money used to save us uh, from buying things at exorbitant rates. Now, what part of this money is corruption what part of this is actually subsidy? Yes, yeah, so 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 uh, the regime of subsidy has been cleaned up quite a bit since 2015. To be fair to the government, but the what we almost recognize is that whenever you introduce, there are two types of subsidies. There's production subsidy and there's consumption subsidy. I call consumption subsidy lazy subsidies, the kind of subsidy that distorts the market. So whenever you have uh, uh, consumption subsidy, the tendency is that folks will position themselves at the point of consumption and try to disaggregate or start to distort consumption so that they can benefit unusually from that kind of subsidy. It is a subsidy that encourages laziness because it is born out of the laziness of the government to actually do its own work to determine who actually needs subsidy. That's why you do uh, consumption subsidy. And what we have in the petroleum sector, just like we have in the power sector for a long time and maybe reduced more recently, and even what we have more so on the in the education sector, the issue that we currently have with ASU is consumption subsidy. It's basically subsidy that is supposedly targeted at the wider population without doing a targeted job of determining who is actually, uh, who actually needs the subsidy and who doesn't. So today, for example, if you have a motor vehicle, if you have six motor vehicles in your parking lot, you actually benefit more from the Nigeria's first subsidy than somebody who is working or is using public transport. But in the real sense, the person that is using public transport and is working that actually needs more of the subsidy because it's poorer. But today, the rich man in Nigeria with six vehicles, with six SUVs, some of them with 50 cars in their convoy, is benefiting more from the fuel subsidy because he has more cars to fuel and is therefore benefiting more in just in pure dollar terms from the subsidy that the federal government put on. Now, consumption subsidy in that sense inherently is corruption because you are, you, are, you are providing it for people who do not need it and who do not require it, and who also have the way without to cheat the system, because they have accountants, they have trucks to be able to truck that petroleum across the border to go and sell and make unusual profits. They have the ability to corrupt the customs agents. They have, so that consumption subsidy naturally creates incentive for corruption, and that is why consumption subsidy must be uh, minimized to avoid distortion in any economy. So when you talk about the corruption that exists in the system of corruption, uh, in the system of, uh, of subsidy today in the petroleum sector, most of it actually will come from corruption by wastefulness. That's the first thing that, we're, we, that, we, that, that, that we'll talk about. The second type of corruption is the corruption by racketeering, where fuel is actually brought into Nigeria. We saw the the, 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 the consumption, the daily consumption of fuel, for example, in Nigeria, it does not make any sense. I mean, so we are looking at our surrounding countries. There was a news report that was done in Cameroon, the same thing about Nigeria and then the Republic, where trucks are leaving Nigeria to go and sell across the border at almost four to five times the price of oil. In Africa today, Nigeria, Nigeria, uh, Nigerians are benefiting from the fourth lowest, the fourth lowest cost of oil in the, in the entire continent is, is currently in Nigeria. We are, we are, as a result of that, 
what you're having is that there's an incentive inherently in the system for Nigerians to actually, or Nigerian businessmen, as you want to call it, to take that fuel from Nigeria and ship it to the surrounding countries. Nigeria today is buying fuel at about 42 cents, equivalent of 42 cents uh, uh, per litre. Whereas our surrounding countries, like Benin Republic, is doing it at almost $1.30. Countries like, uh, countries like uh, uh, Zimbabwe and Central African Republic, they are doing it at $2.39. We're having countries that are doing it at almost six times of what we are doing, or eight times in the case of Zimbabwe, nine times in the case of, uh, of uh, Central African Republic. Morocco, even in another gas producing, producing uh, other gas producing countries are, are even doing much higher. South Africa is doing at $1.61, but we are doing at 42 cents. And we are the first boys in Africa. So naturally speaking, you have created incentive for racketeering corruption. So these are the issues when we talk about corruption. So Nigerians, at the end of the day, are basically subsidizing our neighbors. And so when we say the subsidy is three point uh, three trillion and above, maybe in reality the real subsidy gets into Nigerians. That is Nigerians as the Nigerians that live in this country it might just be one point five trillion of that amount of money because the rest are sipping across the border because we have created racketeering corruption incentive. And so we as a people must think about economic policy by itself. You cannot disobey the law, laws of economics uh, and think that you will get away with it. There's a way human behavior adjusts to economic reality. And so whenever we are, we are creating an artificially low price, which does not make sense, and our neighbors have the real, and, real market price, businessmen and entrepreneurs, whether you call them agents of corruption or not, will try to corrupt the system. And when they do so, they will meet your customs man who is barely earning 50,000, 100,000, 200,000 Naira per month at the border. And what does it take them to take care of him? And the moment they do take care of him by bribery and corruption, the, your, your good news are across the border, and it ends up being an economic leakage and sabotage against Nigeria. So the first thing is let us fix the reality that we should stop this consumption subsidy across all sectors, not just in petroleum. When you stop consumption subsidy, what you can subsidize and which smart countries do is to subsidize production. You go to the production mouth and you subsidize producers. When producers produce and they produce more, overall, you tend to be able to drive down the cost of production over a long period. It will not happen immediately. Initially, you might still have an high cost of production because you are just learning how to produce. But over a long period of time, when you produce more, the laws of, uh, of supply and demand will drive prices lower. But when you create, on the other side, consumption subsidy, you create corruption. And as a result, you don't even produce. You start importing poverty the way Nigeria is doing today. We're importing petroleum, which we actually produce the crude oil. And so therefore, we're importing poverty and we're exporting jobs. Jobs that should be created in Nigeria refineries, Jobs that is created in Nigeria's marketing value chain, we are exporting it and importing poverty because we encourage a regime of consumption subsidy. So that is the price we pay for consumption subsidy and the racketeering corruption, Sorry. as well as an inherent inefficiency that we've introduced into this. To watching TVC Breakfast on this segment, we've been talking about the issue of removal of oil subsidy. Recall that the president, in presenting the budget appropriation for 2023, of the budget of 20.5 trillion naira, he was saying that by the middle of next year, an oil subsidy should go. But the National Assembly has said, you know what, this might cause trouble or problem for the incoming government because they will just be taking over at that time. And we're looking at the possibility of that. And we have a policy uh, analyst and public sector analyst, Michael Oluagbemi, trying to make sense of all of these to us. Now, Michael, before we go on the break, some had asked you of uh, round tripping, and you were going to explain that to us, how it all, how it all plays out in this uh, system. Yes. So, so, so this is another third form of potential leakage and corruption. And it's been potentially been taken advantage of also when you are doing, there are two types of subsidy that is going on, by the way, that Nigerians have to understand. There's a direct funding of the subsidy by the fact that we're taking cash that we don't have, uh, which essentially is sacrificing money that we should have obtained from export of crude oil and sacrificing it to obtain petroleum product that we then burn that is going to people that mostly do not need it. As I've already explained, most of the people that use or take advantage of first subsidy are the elites, the people who have cars, multiple cars, multiple convoys, government officials. These are the people that take advantage mostly well, subsidies. For the most part, the poor benefit from, okay, lower transport fares, but for the large parts, they get a very tiny percentage of the full subsidy. So this is money that goes directly as a result of loss of revenue to the federal government by way of oil revenue. There's also another side to that. 
There's another size of subsidy, which is because we buy imported petroleum products, unfortunately, because we do not have internal production today, because we destroyed our refineries that were built in the 70s, and we destroyed them in the 80s and 90s, and we're now paying the price for that, is that we also now fund our subsidy regime by forex. Now, that forex goes out not at the street street, at the, what they call the black market rate, parallel market rate, at about 700 to 750 today. They go at the official rate. So essentially, there's another 300 Naira subsidy because the official rate is about 419. So the, 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 the difference, the arbitrage between the official rate and the parallel market rate is about 300 Naira. So the federal government, by virtue of its swap programs through the NNPC, provides essentially currency, uh, uh, dollars, to those people who import on behalf of the NNPC at the official rate, not at the street rate. So we are losing 300 Naira on every dollar spent. Yeah. So that provides an arbitrage opportunity and an opportunity for currency round tripping. So if you imagine if an agent of the government, uh, of the NNPC, for example, that is asked to bring 10 million liters of fuel to Nigeria today, and is then allocated dollars, that dollar is being allocated at 419. What the person can do, knowing that there can be a movement or a shift in dollar rate and all of that stuff, the person can make a bet and go to the market and make a quick money, take $1 million out of the money that was allocated to him, what, what, a billion dollars or more? Take $10 million, take $20 million, take $30 million, and go to the, go to the black market and sell it for 700 And then come back again and find somebody who has obtained money at official rates for 419 who is willing to dispose it of at 520 so you can make the difference between 520 and 720, 200 naira for doing nothing. So this is essentially what we call round tripping. And it is what is possible because we have created this system of consumption subsidy. So it happens and it's of course, there's some level of market intelligence and monitoring that should be done by CBM, but you cannot police 300 naira difference, almost a 40% difference in the official rate when it comes to the test and the need of an, of, uh, of uh, so-called wise entrepreneurs who are trying to take advantage of the system, when they are determined to take advantage of that system, you cannot police it. What will be better is that number one, you do not have a subsidy at all. Or number two, even if you are going to do the subsidy, then they have to take it at the operating market, parallel market rate and not at the official rate. So you are creating two levels or two different systems of uh, exchange rates that then creates room for arbitrage, uh, 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 corruption, which we call, uh, uh, which we call round tripping. Okay. Uh, now, some people have talked about or constantly spoken about the need to restructure NNPC. Now it has been restructured or commercialized in such a way that uh, it should be more uh, productive. But others have said that instead of having it the way it is, oh, why not list it in the stock exchange for Nigerians to have a buy-in where it becomes a public company for all Nigerians and then there is better... Uh, 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 shareholders can monitor what's going on and then you answer to Nigerians instead of the way that it is. How challenging would that be, having it in that regard? Yeah, good question. I don't think it's going to be challenging. I think it's uh, for you to take any company public uh, as is being demanded. Uh, there's a process to that. NMPC, unfortunately, has been well, not been well managed over the years. Um, for example, one of its biggest assets is over 5,301 kilometers of refined petroleum pipeline, one of the most advanced in the world that connects the entire country today. Today we have fuel uh, scarcity in Abuja because of the road flooding in Lokoja as a result of the swelling of the River Niger River. Benway, because the trailers cannot go through Lokoja, the main connection between the north and the south of Nigeria, unfortunately, I mean, again, another infrastructure deficit. But why should our fuel supply in Abuja or in any part of the north of Nigeria be dependent upon the road condition in Lokoja? when Nigeria already has 5,301 kilometers of pipeline. So those pipelines over the years were destroyed as a result of lack of maintenance, especially under the military and even under the early democratic regime we have in this country. Nothing was done about the PPMC network. So our roads began to bear the burden. The reason why we have bad roads in Nigeria is because they began to bear the burden of petroleum tanking and trucking and all the kind of heavy loads that are now meant for our roads are now on our roads. And the roads are now getting destroyed. We're having to spend more money on the roads, and yet we are also are not going to get the petroleum when you have issues like flooding. Essential point there is that NNPC as a company needs to be reformed. It needs to be prepared for it to go public. It cannot just go public in its current state. And I understand that you need time, some years, and it's actually already written or expected. Uh, part of the roadmap of reforms for NNPC 
ultimately the new uh, LNPC limited is that that company ultimately part of it will be listed on the stock exchange and Nigerians will then be able to have a very direct. But whether it is listed or not does not mean it cannot be transparent. By law, every public government owned enterprise in Nigeria has a requirement to publish their audited real. Even government agencies like FEMA, like CBN, they are required by law. So our journalists, especially those of you in the fourth state of the realm, who have to do the word of the work of media, you have to go in there and probe. If there's any chief executive of a federal agency that has not gone to release the audited financial statement three months, four months after the deadline, then they should be called out in our newspapers. They should be called out on TV. They should call on radio because essentially that is the first whiff of corruption within those agencies. So whether NNPC is listed or not does not give them an excuse why they are not transparent. They are owned by the people of Nigeria. They have 208 million shareholders. And they have a requirement to disclose as quickly as they can what they are making within NNPC and what they are not. The good thing is that we have changed the NNPC from what it used to be last year, for example, because we were able to pass the PIA. Under the new regime, NNPC is just basically a manager of those resources and takes a certain percentage as a you know, management fee. And so we, it is very clear what NNPC makes versus what NNPC makes for its client. The client of the NNPC is that 801 governments in Nigeria, which is different from the shareholders of NNPC. The shareholders of NNPC today are the 208 million Nigerians. The clients of NNPC is the 801 government. I mean the federal government, the 36 state government, the 774 local government, and the federal capital territory. Those 801 governments are its clients. And they serve those clients, remit money from JVs, PSC, concessions, and all of that monthly. That is their business of NNPC. As well as, of course, international oil companies, if they are able to get back their, uh, if they are able to get back their refineries to work, through NLNG because they are, they are, they are, NNPC is a major partner in NLNG, in NLNG on behalf of Nigeria. Their, their clients also might include the buyers for gas and all of that stuff. These are the clients of NNPC. We are not going to mistake the client for the shareholder. The shareholder is the Nigerian people. But the work of NNPC is to manage and execute its activities for a fixed fee by law for its clients. And so we know what those clients make. We know what NNPC will charge. And so NNPC has a duty to reduce its operating costs and to ensure that it's operated transparently and reports to the Nigerian people. Those are the innovations that are inherent in the PIA that is now being implemented. I hope in the next few weeks and months and years, we can quickly get to where in the next three to four years, NNPC can also have some part of its equity listed on the Nigerian Stock Exchange as well as on the international exchange, which will also improve transparency. But it is not a deterrence. Why? I'm mentioning this again. Whether NNPC is listed or not, it has to be transparent. And we must demand that it is transparent because we, the shareholders of NNPC, 208 million Nigerians, require to know how the management that work on the basis of our trust are managing that company on behalf of the Nigerian people. Now, um, speak to the inflationary possibilities of a uh, subsidy remover. But before that, on round tripping, there's also the aspect of ships, which also goes into the consumption part of uh, what you have said about subsidy. Ships that claim to, uh, to have brought uh, fuel, and they can, only one ship can arrive 10, 20 times, and uh, it's only one delivery. All right, so, so that, that aspect of it is actually what I call, originally, if you remember, I talked about the 2011 scenario, which yes. was the offer between 2010 and 2011. This was quite a thing where there were claims that fuel were delivered to Nigeria and they were not, where you had a lot of uh, ships coming mm. and coming back and going and claiming that they were delivering fuel, but they were not actually delivering because there was collusion between the federal officials that were supposedly receiving from this private sector operators. Many companies were sanctioned. If you remember, there were a lot yes. of companies were listed. I remember Paris, yes, yes. oil and gas, for example, and the rest of them. Now, that is a specific kind of brazen, what I call brazen eye corruption. I would not even call it round tripping. That is brazen eye corruption. And I think of all of the types of corruption around the subsidy regime, this is one that I will give credit to NNPC that has been curbed because of the new reform that was introduced by way of DSDP and the, the, more, the increased transparency around uh, um, what was swapped for and what Nigeria is getting in terms of fuel. It is published, people know it. And when the fuel is delivered to Jetty, there are inspections and there are different levels of checks by the CBN before they actually release money or back by way of LP, uh, 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 by way of uh, letters of credit and all of those kind of things. 
I would say by and large that kind of corruption has been minimized. Again, that is a that is a more of an integrity issue of our federal government of officials, starting with the president. You cannot the kind of corruption you just described can only happen if the president is in collusion with the entire system to effect that kind of corruption on Nigerian people. We are fortunate that at least if that kind of corruption is still going on, the subsidy bill you'll be getting is not going to be 3.5 trillion naira. It's going to be close to 10 trillion because again, how many times can the guy run trip? The guy can decide to run trip 10 times, 20 times. You, there's no limit to the kind of uh, the kind of uh, I mean, not round tripping. I won't use that word round tripping. I will actually use uh, a collusion or of it is just delivery. How many times can he do it? The guy can send a ship 20 times and not really deliver anything. So the kind of corruption that you're talking about in that area, <laughs> um, um, God forbid Nigeria is still going through it under this current high fuel energy cost con uh, condition occasioned by, the, of course, the, uh, 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 the Ukraine-Russian war. Now, talking about the impact of inflation. Inflation, of course, naturally, Energy is a very big component of that. And we should be very worried about the potential for how much high inflation that we're already experiencing. We are a country, by and large, I always think we've been a country that, uh, unlike the spring chickens of, uh, of uh, the West or, or the East Asian countries, we've been living with um, high inflation probably almost our entire independent life, you know, life as an independent country. And, and so we are, not, we are not easily, our economy does not necessarily get shocked um, by as much as other economies does by higher inflation, but we must still manage it. We must try to bring the inflation at the current 18% level down to closer to 12, 11, 10% if we want to allow the country to grow and we want credits to circulate and we want people to thrive and we want wealth to be retained. Uh, there's a potential and we must admit it. So that's why I say there is no economic decision without the cost. So the cost of removing subsidy is that there might be uh, and there will be some level of inflation. But I think the level of inflation that is being predicted or is being modeled is wrong. Why? Because of what I've already explained before. Because by and large, most of what you are calling for subsidy is actually not subsidizing Nigerians. It's subsidizing Beninois, Nigerians, Cameroonians. So the reality, that 3.6 trillion, you're not getting the full effect of inflation reduction as a result of it. You are getting some effect. Maybe one trillion of it is actually trickling down into the Nigerian economy, and maybe 2.6 trillion is actually going out of the Nigerian economy. So if you eliminate the entire 3.6, the impact of inflation will not be the full impact of removing 3.6 trillion. It's just going to be the impact of removing one trillion because it's only one trillion that was really coming to Nigerians. And also there will be some behavioral adjustment. Big men that used to have five cars in their, in, their, in their garage, we realized that they cannot sustain fuel in one vehicle with 50,000 error. I was in Senegal uh, in April, and the small Toyota Corolla, we took it to the petrol station, actually uh, 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 got tanked up with 38,000 error. The same car in Nigeria will get full filled up with seven to 8,000 error. So you can see that if I'm somebody who has a Toyota Corolla, suddenly, number one, I might not be filling my car 100% every time I go to the gas station, if uh, to the petrol station, once the fuel starts re reflecting the true cost. And two, I might have make more decision to drop the car at home and not you know, use it all the time uh, once I pay that kind of fuel cost. And number three is that if I'm th thinking of buying a Jeep, I would drop the idea and keep the money for the Jeep and go and buy a smaller car. So the reality is also that there will be some behavioral adjustment by Nigerians once right. they start paying the true price of fuel. So okay. it will not have the full effect of inflation or some kind of partial effect of it. But we must be prepared for it, it's a reality. All right. We have to leave it here now. Thank you very much, uh, Michael Uluagbemi, for all of the breakdown of analysis, bringing us insight into the dimensions and uh, dynamics of all of these. We look forward to a greater year ahead. Thank you very much for talking to us this morning on TVC Breakfast. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Great.